A Waco mom is under investigation tonight after reporting her two daughters missing. But here's the thing. Police say she'd actually forgotten to pick them up from daycare. The closely watched Curtis Shelley case is expected to go before a grand jury by March. Seven people were injured, possibly an eighth at the school. According to officials with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, two suspects have been taken into custody. Many Texas lawmakers are against the bill and we asked you what should the penalty be for marijuana possession in Texas? What I want to show you is this interactive graphic we have. So you're going to scroll down to about middle of this story and you'll find this graphic here and it has all the people involved in this story and their connection to the case. Louisiana fire officials say the same suspect is responsible for fires that burned three historically black churches. And that means those bogus roofing companies could be on the prowl looking to make a quick buck. Some Texas food truck owners say they are furious with the Waco Chamber of Commerce. Hey guys, I'm here at the Deep in the Heart Film Festival's red carpet event. It features so many films over the next four days. It's possible to find all sorts of nasty things if you took <laughs> swabs from people's hair and hands and tested them. Right. But, you know, Micah, who's my boyfriend who has a beard, if you're watching this, maybe it's time to clean it up. Is there like a basic little step you can teach me real quick? Sure. Okay. Oh, this will be interesting. Okay. So just, uh, there you go. You go, go Leslie. Woo. Today, the power couple announced they're bringing a new television network to the city. Channel 6's Jasmine Caldwell is live in downtown Waco. She spoke to people who say they cannot get enough of the famous couple, and I am one of them as well. Hey, Jasmine. I ran into so many basketball fans who are taking in the sights now so they don't miss any of this weekend's action. By but the way. do they name it after Kim Mulkey? I don't know. Do they <laughs> name it after us? Oh, well, yeah, you think? I told them I can give them a $100 donation. Towards that $30 million? <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll see if that works yeah. out. I'm going to be out there. I'm going to test my skills against some of the basketball greats. I promise there are going to be no skills on my my end. Hey, what was the last time you were at the library? You know, I'm a book nerd, so I was actually at the library last night, and I have 11 books checked out. We should have uh, should have rethought that. <laughs> That's how you know it's live, folks. <laughs> well, it was a beautiful night tonight at the Santa Fe Plaza here in Temple. They are getting a new look with their fountain all lit up for the very first time. Looks absolutely beautiful and folks out there enjoying the night as well. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Leslie Draffin. Chris Radcliffe has the night off. Well, let's talk about the weather because it looked gorgeous out there. Chief Meteorologist Andy Anderson joins us with the details. Hey, Andy. Tonight, we are learning more details about a Colleen private track coach who admitted to sexually assaulting a 17 year old in June 2017. Now we know there were other claims of assault made against 56 year old Carrie Sloan during his 20 year military career. Channel 6's Cole Johnson joins us now with more details. Hey, Cole. Jonathan Scott, the father of a Temple woman who was killed earlier this year, has started a petition calling for changes to Texas's protective order laws. As of now, the petition has over 2,500 signatures. Jenna Scott tried to file a protective order against Cedric Marks after she said he broke into her apartment. Jenna and her friend Michael Swearingen were reported missing from Temple in January and then were found dead in rural Oklahoma. Well, tonight, Robinson police are identifying the man they say shot and killed himself after a nearly eight hour standoff this morning. Brian Richard Dunbar died at his home on Greg Drive and Heston Circle. Police say he called them this morning just before two, saying someone tried to poison him with a cigarette. When officers got there, Dunbar had a gun, so officers backed off and then police heard shots fired from inside the house. A SWAT team eventually made entry and they found Dunbar dead inside a closet from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. No one else was there. Well, outrage is building after Education Secretary Betsy DeVos submitted a budget proposal which included cutting all federal funding to Special Olympics. But what would that look like here in Texas? Curtis Quillen has those answers and joins us now. Hey, Curtis. Still to come, a prom proposal unlike any other. What two friends did to ask their dates to prom Plus, a viral video of the Pope catching criticism. You can find out why in tonight's six more things to know coming up. For the last few months, I have been researching and reporting on the Joe Bryan case. He's the former Clifton High School principal convicted of killing his wife, Mickey, back in 1985. The murder shocked that small town. But what made it even more shocking is just a few months earlier, another person was murdered. 
17 year old Judy Whitley. Now Judy was found bound and nearly naked in a field just outside town. And tonight I sit down with Judy's sister Patricia, who for the first time explains why she believes Judy's murder and Mickey Bryan's murder are connected. Judy was always like a little clown. She was. She loved animals. She had a cat. She always made her smile. Judy Whitley was the youngest of four children. And although they were almost 10 years apart, she was closest with her oldest sister, Patricia. I would never leave that house unless I said, love you, Judy. And she used to tease her all the time like that. She said, stop it. And that's how she said goodbye on the day Judy died. She was standing on the front porch. I said, Bye, Judy, love you, kisses, kisses. You know, that just drove her nuts. And I drove away, and that was the last time I saw her. Patricia says on that June day, Judy walked to a store to get a Coke and then went missing. I can't believe what I'm hearing, you know. Judy's gone, what are you talking about? So we couldn't find her. We're looking all over the place. We're calling all of her friends, everybody. Next thing I know, Dennis Dunlap is telling my entire family and the police department gathered in that room that we found Judy and she is dead. I can't even tell you the emotions that was going through that room. My whole family was just torn apart that day. Literally. Dennis Dunlap, a Clifton police officer Patricia once went on a date with immersed himself in the case. And he was all over with my family and stuff, trying to console us. But Dunlap wasn't who they thought he was. Now that I look back on it, I just feel like he was watching. A few weeks after Judy's death, Patricia saw Dunlap in town. He said he'd taken a lie detector test in Judy's murder and would soon be moving. I thought it was kind of weird. I thought, why are you moving now? Why are you leaving? Police department. Before he could, a rumor started about a diary Judy wrote everything in, but Patricia says it never existed. Nope. Nope. My sister did nothing as far as uh, writing in a diary or anything like that. When police couldn't find it, they decided to search Judy and Patricia's grandmother's home. But before that search could happen, the house blew up. It woke me up out of my bed and you could hear it and you could see everywhere. When the smoke cleared, the case went cold until almost 10 years later when Dunlap committed suicide. Afterwards, the Clifton Police Department said he had murdered Judy. It almost felt a little bit relief, but I was angry. And we were angry that they could not say that when he was still alive. Patricia says she always suspected Dunlap had something to do with her sister's murder. She believes he may also have killed Mickey Bryan. In my heart, I knew that he murdered my sister and he murdered Mickey Bryan. That's why she and several other women testified during Joe Bryan's evidentiary hearing this summer. They all claimed Dunlap had a history of stalking women. One even tried filing a police report against him, but says nothing was done. After his suicide, Dunlap's ex-wife was interviewed by the Texas Rangers. In court documents presented in Brian's hearing, Dunlap's ex admitted to talking with him about Judy's death. She also claimed one of Dunlap's friends told her after he died that he had admitted to having sex with Judy and killing her. She also said Dunlap claimed he had been dating Mickey Bryan and had been with her the night she died. Jan Zolke and her daughter Laura lived in Clifton when Judy and Mickey were murdered. Like many in that town, they were mesmerized by the killings. Shocking that this young girl was killed because nobody could figure out why. That question is why the mother-daughter duo decided to write a book based on the murders. We felt like those women died before their time and that they were innocent bystanders of what was going on and we don't know what was going on. Earlier this year, they published No Motive in Murdoch, a fictional novel loosely based on the 1985 killings. My prayer is that the truth will come out. It needs to come out so Clifton can put it to rest. As for Patricia, she hopes for justice. If not for Judy, then for Joe. My sister's dead. They could never 
take care of the person that did that to her. If I can't get any justice for my sister, at least I can get something for Joe Bryant. Well, Joe Bryan's attorneys met with Judge Doug Shaver and the Bosque County District Attorney today to submit their final findings in Bryan's evidentiary hearing. And now it is up to Judge Shaver to make a recommendation to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals about the case. For a full timeline of the Whitley and Bryan murders, visit our website, kcentv.com. Welcome back. We all know dogs are man's best friend, but it turns out they're also good for our health. And this week's Your Best Life, a special dog edition where I explore all the ways dogs help us make life better and we meet some pretty amazing pups and their people along the way. I just think he's made such a difference at our hospital. Um, I think our patients cope better because of him. I think our staff is a happier staff because he's here. Um, I just think he's made the whole experience of being at the hospital better for everybody. At McLean Children's Hospital in Temple, a dog named Lorenzo is busy at work. He loves to get up on the bed. Um, he loves to play fetch and, and pick things up and give things to patients. He is the calmest dog ever. He is very, um, some people call him like stoic. His face is just very calm, very um, collected. And he loves to snuggle with patients. He gets up on the bed. Um, he really enjoys just being close to our patients, interacting with our patients. The three-year-old golden retriever lab mix works alongside Leah Woodward and Ashley Blackman, who are certified child life specialist. Together, the team helps patients cope with hospitalization. He can help patients calm and, and help um, relieve anxiety and stress. Woodward and Blackman say since getting Lorenzo a year ago, they've been constantly surprised at his ability to guide patients through tough times. We hear things from uh, from patients like Lorenzo makes me feel at home or Lorenzo takes the pain away. His emotional impact um, is really even greater, I think, than we thought it would be. Nine-year-old Riley Picot met Lorenzo during a scary procedure she had at the hospital and knows how much he makes kids feel better. He always brings the kids' spirits up whenever they're sad because you're focused on him and not what they're doing. She believes he also loves what he does. Because he's always wagging his tail and he's always smiling. Seems to put a smile on my face when I'm playing with dogs. Yes, good boy. Mike Pierce Down works with dogs, dogs every day but, you know, as the owner of Loose Leash Happy Paws. Good drink. The 22-year Army veteran says... There you go. Good girl. Taking care of his dogs and others Close makes it. life better. As soon as I call his name, he's going to look at me with with those, you know, almond eyes and the, the ears kind of goofy and, and start wagging his tail, just like you saw a while ago. And, and it's going to immediately make me forget everything. It's just that unconditional love. Uh, this has been very good for me too. So. Mental health professional <laughs> Kyler Shumway knows all too well the unconditional love of a dog. I still remember the day when we went and got to pick him out and I met my new best friend. Uh, his name was Oliver. He was a yellow lab. Absolutely amazing dog. My favorite thing to do was I would take a broom handle and I became Sir Kyler the Knight. And Oliver and I would run through the woods outside my house and I would protect him from monsters and all sorts of scary things that would come our way. Uh, but little did I realize that it was actually Oliver that was really protecting me. Um, throughout most of my childhood, I was really severely bullied. And there were days where I'd come home and I just didn't feel like I mattered. And there would be Oliver and he would jump on me and kiss away the tears and remind me that I was loved. And while science backs up all the things dogs do for us, from decreasing depression, relieving stress, providing purpose and calming anxiety, you only need to look at these smiles to know. Dogs really do make life better. They sure do. All right, for more on the science behind why dogs are so good for you, head over to our website, kcentv.com, and check out this story. Also, tune in tonight at 10 when I introduce you to two Temple teenagers who aren't just living better lives because of dogs, they're helping dogs live better lives too.